All right, Acts chapter 20. Let's stand, shall we? We'll, we'll begin in verse 6 tonight. Acts chapter 20 and verse 6. You follow along. It says, And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow and continue to speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat at a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell upon him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. They brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. Now let's pray. Father, we thank you again now for your word and, Lord, for the account that we read tonight. Lord, we do thank you for the blessings this week, Lord, of how you just little things so often that we take for granted that we just kind of pass by. Lord, I think of Brenda's testimony. An aunt died. As far as she knew, was not saved. Lord, how tragic. Lord, how tragic. To be born and live and die in America probably never heard a clear presentation of the gospel, Lord. It's hard to imagine, but it is so, even more, so much more in this day in which we live. Father, I thank you for this evening, and I thank you for the few minutes that we have together. Lord, one more time, and I pray that you'll open your word to us this evening. And Lord, that you'll encourage us tonight, encourage us one more time in the Lord's table, we pray. Lord, that you might bless us, Lord, even this evening. I thank you for all the folks who will come back out tonight. And Lord, again, we pray that you'll meet with us in these few moments. Lord, bless us, we ask, and help us, we pray, and open your word to us, and open yourself to us, we, we ask. Lord, may we be drawn closer tonight to thee, close to thee, close to thee. Lord, may we be drawn closer to thee thee tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Paul preached, it says, the Bible says, until about midnight, that was a long time. And actually, he preached a lot longer than midnight because it said he actually spoke until the beginning of the day. There are lots of jokes about long-winded preachers. A man came into church, kind of sat in the back. The preacher had already started preaching and he tapped the guy's shoulder in front of him and said, how long has he been preaching? And the guy in front of him just turned around and said, he's been preaching about 40 years. And the guy said, well, I'll stay then because he ought to be about finished. And so, you know, there are people talk about how long he's preached, long-winded. Paul was long-winded. He preached until midnight, the Bible says. Now, they had gotten together at Troas, and they were... Going to break bread. Breaking bread, of course, is a terminology about the Lord's table. Uh, usually, not always, but usually the tradition in the early church was that every time they met together, they would observe the Lord's table. Now, the Bible again tells us as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. The Bible doesn't really say how often is often. Uh, of course, our, our custom here is this. I, I don't like tradition too much, but our custom is that we try to observe the Lord's table once a month. That's what we try to do. Uh, and at Troas, they were going to observe the Lord's table. They were going to break bread together. And the Bible says that Paul preached a long time. He, whatever time they started, I don't know, but he preached until midnight. And about midnight, there was this boy named Eutychus, or young man named Eutychus, and, and he was uh, up in the third window. They must have had, you know, standing room only or whatever, and and he was up in the third loft, and Paul was preaching and preaching and preaching. And about midnight, the young man became drowsy. And the Bible says this, that 
as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down in verse 9. He sunk down with sleep. He fell asleep. Uh, Paul was preaching so long. And I don't feel so bad if they fall asleep on Paul. So, you know, uh, when I see it, you know, it's not so bad. But Paul's preaching, and it's about midnight. And, he, and as he's preaching, the young man falls asleep, and he fell asleep, and he, third, he fell from the third story. And he fell down, probably down in the, in the, in the middle. He had the uh, three, as I would see it, they had the, uh, the, the balcony, then they had a balcony above it, and he was up there, and he fell down uh, into the midst, and everybody, everybody's looking in, and he's dead. He's dead, as it says there in that, and was taken up dead in verse 9. He was taken up. Everybody, I'm sure, is crowded around him. Now, we don't know anything about Eurycus. We don't really know how old he was. If he was married, we don't know that. I would suggest that he probably was not. I would not believe that he had children. I, I would say that he was a young man, and probably perhaps his mother was there. Can you imagine her horror when her son fell from the third floor down into the midst, and everybody was saying, he's dead. I mean, he's dead. I mean, he fell... If a story, I, I always kind of like it, like it at 10 feet. If he fell 30 feet, brother, you don't have to fall very far to get killed. I, I remember a, a good, good man. He was a good man. Good man. Good saved man. Knew, him, knew his children well. Uh, he was, uh, he had been a locksmith, and really there wasn't a lot of work for it, so he got a job in construction. And, you know, he wasn't really a good construction guy. He was just kind of a helper. And, they were building a house, and, and uh, they were on the first floor, and there was a basement, and, and uh, somebody had taken the plywood off the hole that had covered up the, the, where the stairs were going to be, and he fell eight feet with a hard hat on, and it killed him. You don't have to fall very far to be killed, and Eutychus fell 30 feet. Now, can you imagine the horror of the folks who were there, Paul been preaching, and and all of a sudden, that maybe perhaps someone screamed, look out, he's falling. And perhaps his mother was there. And if he was old enough, maybe his wife was there and, or, or whatever. But everybody is gathered around him. And, and the consensus of, the, of everyone is this, he's dead. He's dead. And so Paul comes down, if he was above the people, and as was uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the the. The, the preachers, if you would, were above the people. Paul was probably above the people. They had met on the first day of the week, which is the day that we meet on, uh, the first day of the week, and they were going to have the Lord's table, and Paul was only there for seven days, had a seven-day revival meeting. He was preaching long on the first day of the week, and Eutychus falls down dead. Everyone, I'm sure, is gathered around him, and they're all sorrowful. The guy, the kid is dead, and his mother perhaps his wife or some other relative is there or, or just the church family. I mean, how would we feel if, if the preacher was preaching a long time and, and somebody fell over dead? I mean, that's happened in churches before. If everybody gets up to leave and so-and-so sits there because they died in the service. I mean, that was a long service, but they died in the service. Paul pushes his way down through the crowd. And it tells us then in verse 10, he went down and fell on him, embracing him. Paul hugged him, brought him to himself, and hugged him and said this to them, God, trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. He said, now, now don't worry, he's, he's all right. Now, I would suggest to you that he was dead. I would suggest that he was dead. I mean, there are accounts in the book of Acts of people who had died. We think, I, I believe it was, I believe it was Tabitha. I'm not positive, but but uh, someone died. Dorcas who it wasn't died, and, and they had called for for Peter to come, and and he went in and, and prayed, and and her life was restored, and and, and so in, in this case, I would suggest that he was dead, that he was dead. They they were all around him, and it's said in verse nine, and was taken up dead. He was dead. He was dead. That's what he was. He was dead. But Paul came and embraced him and and hugged him and and said. And, I, and I, I believe prayed over him, prayed. Can you imagine the, the, the sorrow of the crowd, of the people in church? I mean, can, uh, aren't you going to be sorrowful? Tr truly, I know that 
Pete often jokes about it. But aren't you going to be sad when Pete's gone? You know, uh, I, you'll have to ask him that. You know, Pete is very witty. I've only ever seen half of it, so he's a half wit. But, you know, I, I, uh, Pete is very witty. He's all the time telling me jokes. And, and uh, he watches Hee Haw or whatever it is, and he tries to tell me jokes. I'm going to miss him. I will miss him when he's gone. But can you imagine those folks back there that night? It's midnight. There aren't any doctors. There are no emergency room. There isn't anybody. So Paul calls 911 and he calls God and he prays. And God gives back Eutychus' life. And Paul pushes his way back through the crowd. You know how it is somebody's dead or something, and everybody's crowding around, you know, give him some air, give him some air. He's dead. I mean, you don't need it. He doesn't need it here. Give him some air. The crowd's all crowded around him. And the Apostle Paul pushes his way back through the crowd and says to everybody, he says, hey, everybody, don't worry. He's okay. And the, it says the last thing it says about this particular incident in verse 12, it says, and we're not a little comforted. I mean, they were comforted. But he's alive. He's alive. Now, the lesson really from this is not so much that Eutychus was alive. And, and he was, but, but this, that they were going to break bread that night. They were going to observe the Lord's table. That's what they were going to do. And the fact that Eutychus was alive, that he had fallen 30 feet, about 30 feet, and, and you may say, well, 30 feet isn't very far. Well, it's far enough. And that had fallen 30 feet. The building is 40, so it would take 10 off. He's only fell that distance, and he was dead. But Paul said, don't worry about it. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. And the, and the lesson to take from that tonight is, is that they were going to break bread, and the Bible says, do this in remembrance of me, is not so much that Eutychus is alive, but that we have a Savior who is alive tonight, that Jesus is alive. Um, we, we think about the, the joy in Jerusalem that night, that morning. You think about Mary Magdalene who uh, went out to the tomb, and we think about Peter and John. Peter and John ran out to the tomb after the women had come back into town and said, he is not there. And, and some of them said, we have seen an angel. And, and some of them said, Mary came back into town. Mary Magdalene came back into town and told the disciples that he is alive, that he is alive. Now, folks, you got to, you and I both know this. When somebody is, unless it's a miracle of God, when somebody is dead, particularly as in Jesus' case, he had been dead for three days. Mary Magdalene comes running back into town telling everybody he's alive. He really is alive. He is alive. I mean, can you imagine at least somewhat reserved joy that they might have, that he really is alive, that he is alive. I think about the disciples on the road to Emmaus that night. Now, it is obvious that Jesus has appeared to others even by that evening. But, and as the disciples, Cleopas and his wife, probably Mary, uh, said uh, to Jesus, I was talking, uh, that some of the women have said, have testified to the fact that he's alive. Now, I would venture to say that by Monday, as we know Monday, because it was the first day of the week, that by Monday, word is all spread all around through Jerusalem that Jesus, who was dead, is alive. I mean, think of the joy that they must have experienced that this one whom they thought was the Son of God, who they knew to be the Son of God, who had believed on, who was crucified and was dead, but now he's alive. I mean, he's alive. And tonight as we think about the, the Lord's table and as we're about in the next couple minutes, the fact is that we serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. Now let's face it, there are a lot of people who would testify to the fact that Jesus is not alive. But thank God we know tonight that Jesus is alive, amen? And the Bible says this, now is Jesus risen from the dead. I mean, we've got something to rejoice about tonight as we come to the Lord's table. Uh, the Lord's table, number one to us tonight, is a reminder. It's a reminder that Jesus is alive. He's alive tonight. As we look at the world situation, boy, we are reminded that this living Savior that we serve, one day is going to come back. Secondly, about this, about it, not, only, not only was Jesus alive, not only were we reminded about that, but you'll note in, in verse 11, when he was therefore come up again, 
and had broken bread and eaten, talked a long while, even till break of day, as he departed. The seven-day revival is over. They, Paul's got a lot to say, a tremendous amount to say. He had preached until midnight. Eutychus had fallen down. They had revived him. They had observed the Lord's table. Paul also began to speak again. He had much to say, and he spoke. He, he had a, a look. We, let's, he probably had an eight, nine, ten-hour sermon, and I don't think he, now some of them fell asleep evidently, but uh, he had an eight, nine, ten-hour sermon. They had all day. They had all night church. Paul's getting ready to leave, and it tells us in verse twelve, and they brought the young man alive. They brought him alive, and were not a little. One of the things about people who, men, and, and women for that matter, who are in the Army, or in the Marines, or the Navy, whatever it may be, if they are gone for a long time, for a long time, we're talking six months, eight months, nine months, a year, maybe even longer, they say that when they come home, they will testify to this, that they are, they are so happy to be home, to be sitting at their own table, to be drinking from their own coffee cup. I read what one soldier said. The fact that his wife could reach out across the table and just touch his hand, to sit there with his children. I, I, I know that difficult. Separation is difficult. I know that. I, I, I'm well aware of that. And, I, I'm, and I'm sure that, you know, Doug being home all week and, you know, if, somebody said, well, if my husband was home all week like that, he'd just drive me crazy. No, I, I don't think so. And, and I'm sure they're, but to think for a month, six months, a year, even longer, and then to come home and to see your children. You see them on TV all the time. These service people that have been gone a long time and they're, their kids are there, or their dogs are there, you know, whatever, and, and the dog's glad to see them, the kids are glad to see them, uh, uh, mom and dad's glad to see them, and they're so glad to be to their own home, and they're so glad just to see their wife again. They are comforted by that fact that they are home. When we read about Eutychus, he fell from the second story up there, People were, the third story, the people were, were comforted by the fact that he's alive. Number one, he's alive. Number one, he's alive. And as it says in that verse 12, and they brought the young man alive. Not only is he alive, but now they're comforted by the fact. It's a sad thing when somebody dies. Now, it's not as sad as when lost people die, but it's still a sad thing when saved people die. I, I don't care. You can act spiritual. You can act the pious all you want, but if you really love somebody and they die, it's a sad, sad day. Now, we're not sorrowing as others. I read that in First Thessalonians again last week, chapter 4, that we don't sorrow even as others which have no hope. We don't sorrow like that. We don't sorrow as others which have no hope. We don't sorrow that way. They have no hope. They'll never see their loved one again. But we are comforted by the fact that there are people we are comforted by the fact there are people. And again, I'll pick on Pete because I love him. And, and uh, what, are, what are you, 80, Pete? 83, 84, 85, 86, 90? Anyway, one day, one day, one day, one day, Pete will no longer sit in our midst. There are people tonight who at one time sat in our midst, and who are no longer with us. They have gone over and passed over to the other side. But we are comforted by that. We are comforted by the fact that they are at home. They are there. At one time, they, they sat and they broke bread with us. They observed the Lord's table. Somebody, I, I'm not a, I do not believe in apostolic succession by that uh, people say, well, what does that mean? Well, it simply means, well, the apostles were there and, and, uh, somebody, and somebody was with them and then the next time they were there and the apostles weren't there, but somebody was there and then blah, 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 all the way on. 
The truth is that, but one of the things about the Lord's table is that it is a succession. As we think back that people have been with this and then they weren't there the next time. But there are others there this time. We are comforted by the fact tonight. Eurychus was taken up alive. They were comforted by that. They said, boy, this is great. This is wonderful. But not only is the Lord's, not only is this account tonight a reminder that Jesus is alive, but it's a reminder of the fact and a comfort to us tonight that Jesus has gone on to heaven and he's there preparing a place for us and people who have observed the Lord's table here with us have now passed over to the other side and they are comforted there and say, well, how do you know that? Simply by the story in Luke chapter 16 about the Lazarus. And Abraham said to him expressly, he said, son, remember in your lifetime, you received the good things and Lazarus the bad, but now he is comforted. He's in heaven. Well, at that time he's in paradise, he's in heaven now. But it's like he is comforted by it. And tonight as we come to the Lord's table, we're reminded as often as we do this, do this in remembrance until the Lord come. Well, he has not come and there have been a whole lot of people that have already passed over. Some who have observed the Lord's table with us. I think of many, many people, the church where I was uh, saved at, most of that generation, not everybody, most of that generation of people who are in that church when we were first saved, we were first there in 1966. What is that? That's 34 years, 44 years, plus another four years. It's 40, almost 50 years. Most of that generation that was in that church has passed over the other side. The preacher's gone. The guys that really were, and I don't mean this in a negative way, the, the, the men in the church who were pillars in the church, who were men of the church, who worked in the church, who were the deacons of the church, they've all passed over. They're, they're all gone over. If Jesus should tarry, if he should, there will be people in this church who are going to pass over to the other side. But we need to be reminded of this. They're not gone. They're just out of sight for a little while. And that's a comfort to us that Jesus is gone to prepare a place for us and that where he is, there, that's where we're going to be. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it tells us this, that to be absent in the body, while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. So the contra of that is true, that, while we are, that when we are absent from the body, and we are at home. You think about home for a minute. I realize that not everybody, not everybody, I realize that. Not everybody was able to be brought up in, in, in a really good home. And, and if that was the case, and you have a home now, you ought to make that home uh, a really good place for your children. It, it ought to be a place. But I think about home. I said last Sunday in its soul, every time I left my dad's house, I always turned around to look because I knew that one day would be the last day that I would ever see that place again. And one day it was. One day it was. But I still remember it, and I am comforted by that, of the fact and the memories about home. I, I, I've told you this. Mom, mom, always, see, mom always, it would seem like, would make ham on Sunday. Not always, but she would, and she'd always put clothes in it. Those little black things, and You'd stick in it. And you know what? I can still smell that ham cooking. Even today. And I remember home. And you know what? I'm comforted by the fact that one day, one day, because of what Jesus did, we are all going home. Brethren, that ought to be a comfort to us tonight. When the world looks around, they have nothing, absolutely nothing, to fall back on. But you and I think about man home. We think about those that have one time eaten at this table. And if Jesus tarries, you may be one of them that ate at the table and now have gone home. Not only is this the Lord's table here that we see tonight in Acts chapter 20 about Eutychus, a reminder that Jesus is alive. But secondly, it is a comfort to our hearts that those who have already passed over have gone home. Thirdly, this. 
thirdly this, says that he was taken up, not only is it a, a reminder, not only is it a, a comfort to us, but really the Lord's table tonight is an invitation to you and I to do something for the Lord, to go on for the Lord. In 1847, a little boy named Homan Wash was on the Canadian side of the Niagara Gorge at Niagara Falls. They were having a contest in 1847 to see who could get their kite the highest. Well, the little guy, however old he was, kept putting string and putting string on it, and he got his kite approximately 1,000 feet up into the air. Now, somehow or another, he was on the Canadian side of the gorge. Somehow or another, he got the kite, let the string, whatever, you know, if you let the string off, it'll fall, to come down in an American on the other side of the, of the Niagara River there, at Niagara Falls, at the gorge there. Somebody on the other side is 800 feet across the gorge. An American on the other side grabbed the string. And for the first time, now it's 1847, remember, that's a long time ago. There were no bridges across the Niagara River at that time. Some, uh, somebody on the Canadian side to that piece of string tied a rope. And they slowly pulled that rope across. Well, once they got the rope across, they then attached a cable to it. And then they pulled that cable 800 feet across the Niagara Gorge. And then they attached a heavier cable to it and pulled that one 800 feet across the gorge. Now, the little guy in 1847 won $5. In 1847, that was real money back then. He won $5 for getting his kite the highest. Now, for, for a short time, people would ride a basket across the gorge on that cable for a dollar. I don't think that would have been one of them. They eventually built a footbridge, and you could walk across from the American-Canadian side for a quarter, you could. But within a year of that little boy's kite going up 1,000 feet, then coming down on the American side, they had built the first of 15 bridges across the Niagara. And six of them, six of them are still in use today. And the reason was simply this. That little boy got that kite to go up 1,000 feet, and crossed over to the other side. Who would have thought that there are six bridges, or that there, even back then there were 15 bridges built because one little boy with a piece of string got it over to the other side. See, here's an invitation for you and I. Because starting tonight, starting tonight, including the preacher, including everybody, we come to the Lord's table tonight. It's an invitation at the Lord's table tonight for an, another beginning. Now, I realize that some people, really, I, I know guys who tell you, well, we have the Lord's table once a year. And, and I've actually had preachers tell me that they can't tell, they couldn't tell me the last time they had the Lord's table. Now, for you and I, it's a once a month thing. Once in a while, it's once every two months, but it's usually once a month. Well, here we come tonight. Jesus said, as often as you do this, you do it in remembrance of me until I come. All right, so we've, we, we, we've gone one month now, a little over one month since the last time, and he did not come. So now we're starting the countdown for another month to see if he comes. If he doesn't, here's the invitation. It doesn't take much to get started going for God. It doesn't take much. That little kite string, eventually they got a heavy cable across, and they began to build, they built two 50-foot towers on either side of the gorge, and they had that one cable, and then they began to add other cables, and eventually they got up within a year, they had a bridge across the Niagara Gorge, 1847. And it all started with a little kite string. Look, it doesn't take much to get started for God. Just the determination that, that, Lord, here I am. He said, as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. Tonight, as we come to the Lord's table, we remember what he did for us, how he died for us, how he paid the, the price so that you and I could go free. I said this morning, and it's true. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Lord, here am I. Lord said, who shall go for us? Isaiah said, Lord, here am I. I'm not much. I'm not much. 
of what I am. Lord, here am I. Send me. Tonight's an invitation to get going again. Say, well, I've kind of dropped, dropped the ball a little bit, preacher. And, all right, well, here's the invitation. We're going to start a new month tonight. Doesn't take much. Only takes that little bit of string across Niagara Gorge. Doesn't take much for you and I to get going for God. Lord, here am I. Here am I. It's a reminder. The Lord's table is a reminder. It is a comfort. And it's an invitation for the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again. Lord, for your word. Lord, for the story about Eutychus. He fell down. He was dead. Paul prayed. He was alive. And then they broke bread. They broke bread together. Here's that young man. Lord, as we think about that last idea, Lord, and invitation, he was dead, but now he's alive. They're comforted. And he's starting his life, Lord, starting his life anew. He was dead. Starting. Lord, one time we were dead, trespasses and sins. But Lord, you gave us that life. You quickened us that we are alive tonight because of Jesus. Lord, we're, we are reminded he's alive tonight. Lord, we're reminded you're alive. You are alive. You were dead. Came the first fruits of them that slept. You're alive. And Lord, what a comfort that is to us tonight. Because we do show your death till you come. What a comfort it is to know that people who have shared this table with us have now passed over to the other side and are there waiting patiently for us to cross over. Lord, what a comfort that is. And Lord, an invitation tonight for us to carry on, to go on, to keep on going on in the work of Christ. Lord, encourage us, we pray tonight. Help us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.